Hi, I'm Rick Bush. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager here at Festool USA. Today I'm joined by my colleague, Chris Stevlin, Product Manager, Director of Product Management, I should say, uh, for Festool North America. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Well, we'd like to talk a little bit about the CSC SIS 50. This is our new, what we call sustainer saw, and a little bit about its development. Uh, but first, um, just some really basic questions. How long did it take us to come up with this type of machine? Yeah, it's a great question, Rick. And actually, I would say it was about 10 years in the making. And when I first started on the project, I think it was 2017. So they had already been working on it a little bit. And, and basically what you see today is the final, let's call it product or outcome, was, is even vastly different from what we were, you know, had in mind at the time. So this was a product that uh, we worked on it a long time. And we went back to the drawing board several times and said, well, is this really what we wanted? No. And, and we went out and talked with customers at each step along the way to show them. And um, it, actually, this all at one point was even smaller than this, if you can imagine that. Mm. And uh, when we took it out to customers, said, yeah, it's going to be too small. We needed a little bit bigger, more capacity. So we had to go back with the R&D and figure out, okay, how can we get uh, more capability out of this machine? So a uh, very long time, but maybe one of the longest projects in terms of time to develop what you see before you. Well, taking that amount of time, what were some of the goals we were trying to hit with this design? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think one of the biggest things was if you look at the, the landscape currently as it stands with, with let's call it job site portable, you know, bench top mm -hmm. table saws. Uh, of course, there's a lot of good ones out there. But one thing that we heard from customers it was missing and that we saw that was missing was there wasn't really a, a very precise one and one that could give you that precision you can get in the shop or with a track saw, for example, in this type of format. So one big objective was can we get really precise results out in the field? Um, the second thing was you know, getting that footprint down to be as compact as possible. Um, so obviously this is very compact. If you put the lid on, uh, you'll notice that if it's upright, it looks essentially like a sustainer because that's more or less what it is. And so that was another big objective is how can we get this as compact and as portable as possible uh, so it's easy to transport, but at the same time maintain a reasonable degree of capacities. Mm -hmm. So a saw that's super small that can only do say a six inch rip really isn't that useful. That's what we found out. And so we tried to really push the limits on, can we get you know, as much capacity as possible while still maintaining that footprint? And that's always, of course, a balance. Um, the more capacities you give and the more features, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So finding that balance was, was a big part of the project. So really about the portability. I mean, we do make portable power tools. Yep. That's always about taking the tool to the work, keeping the precision in mind. Yes. But also the performance. Uh, tell us about some of the performance attributes of the machine. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I would say most people, myself included, pretty skeptical initially of, you know, for example, could I cut through eight quarter or two inch thick oak or, mm -hmm. or some of these. Especially being cordless. Yeah, being battery. cordless, yeah. you know, having such a small blade. And uh, I've got a three horsepower uh, saw stop cabinet saw in my personal, personal workshop. And I was really shocked when I first used this that this thing, you know, with, with the right blade in there, it really feels like you're running a cabinet saw. And uh, to me, this is, and to a lot of our customers that we tested this with, they were absolutely shocked at the, what you would call pure power that mm -hmm. this thing has. Um, and kind of a side note there, it's also very quiet. Um, even when you're cutting, it was one of the first comments we got when we showed, shared it with the marketing team was just how quiet this machine is. And it's, it's deceptive. You don't think it has any power because it's so quiet, but then you start cutting and you just notice yeah, very how efficient. Effort, effortlessly it cuts through uh, even very hard materials. Oh yeah, great cut quality too. So we talk about, yeah, portability, precision, power, but who is it really for? What were, we, what were we trying to satisfy in the marketplace? Yeah, well, so, you know, clearly it was not designed with a shop-based person in mind. I mean, that's not to say there, there wouldn't be a time or a place for it to be used in the workshop, um, especially if you're a, a trim carpenter or somebody that works on site but also has a shop that you sometimes do work in. Uh, our main focus here was really for the, the remodeler, the tradesperson that is on the site, and that is cutting, uh, you know, finished materials, whether that be uh, trim materials, it could be flooring, it could be cabinet parts, filler strips, you know, toe kicks, any of these kinds of things where you say, you know what, I need a bit more precision and cleanliness than the typical job site saw is, is going to offer for cutting two by material. Now, that being said, it also can cut the two by material. That's not a problem. Um, and that's maybe one of the things that, that people want to know about is, hey, can I throw a, a two by eight or a two by six through this southern yellow pine? Absolutely. It, ha it has no problem with that. Uh, the one caveat I will note, and this is true of most saws, is this does come with a 48 tooth, what most people call plywood blade. It's the same blade that comes on our TS-60 track saw. Um, so, or sorry, 42 tooth. I said 48. And 
Of course, if you are going to be doing a lot of ripping in something like pine or uh, any kind of framing materials, you would want to swap that out for a, a ripping blade, in my opinion. Well, yeah, you should change your blade depending should change on your blade, yeah, yeah. cross You should fit your blade to your application, ripping, of course. Sure. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really for the person on the job site, uh, you know, people doing installation work, uh, like I mentioned, flooring work. Uh, so pretty much anybody that needs that portability, but also needs to be clean and also needs to have the precision. So um, how many iterations did it take to get this? Well, you said 10 years of development. I mean, obviously we didn't start here, but Correct. the idea of maybe Correct. Like Correct. being in a sustainer format or just had to be super portable. Was, was cordless always a goal? Like how did we start and how did we get to this point? Yeah, it changed a lot, actually. In fact, uh, as I mentioned, I, I first came on the project, I think it was 2016, 2017, um, when I was first exposed to this uh, project. And uh, at that time, it was actually a quarter machine, funny mm -hmm. enough. And uh, or that was at least what we were thinking we had in mind was a quarter machine. And we also had in mind, um, if I remember right, I think the blade was oriented this way instead of this way. So there was, there was like, a lot of changes and from what you see today. Um, in fact, I have to remember, yeah, it's hard to remember, but the point is there was a lot of different iterations. And even before that, we had wooden mock-ups of different concepts. Mm -hmm. And I think really what was the uh, deciding factor was taking it out to customers again and again and again and showing it to them, getting that feedback. And not just here in the U.S., but doing it in Germany and the U.K. and all these other places and, and trying to figure out what were people actually needing to do with the saw. And then as time went on, we got closer and closer to trying to basically match up to those needs. So I would guess there was half a dozen at least serious iterations of this. And when I say iterations, I don't mean like a small tweak. I'm talking, you know, major changes in the concept. Um, but yeah, a lot of changes over the years. So I can imagine at one point we're thinking it would just be a portable table saw. And then someone said, well, hey, it has to go into a sustainer. And then somebody said, what, what if it was the sustainer, right? Well, and I think if I remember right, it's uh, it being in a sustainer was definitely not a requirement. It, because you could have a portable, easy to transport machine that's not in a sustainer, mm -hmm. for example. Um, but I think early in the project, and I don't remember how it transpired, but we either saw people or people mentioned to us, hey, it'd be cool if this had a way to connect in with your broader, you know, mm -hmm. sustainer system, transport system, etc. And so, you know, if you look at this here and how the lid goes on, um, and, and, and really how they, the engineers figured out how to tuck all the parts away, because you gotta have a way to get all these things with it as well, otherwise they get lost. The packaging engineers never get they, enough yeah, credit. They, no, they don't get enough credit, it's a very hard task. Yeah. But um, in this case, like if you look at the, everything from the base to the lid, it wasn't like, hey, well, let's make the saw and then figure out how to put a sustainer around it. Mm -hmm. This really all had to be engineered together. And so once we figured out that with this overall footprint we could make the saw that size then all, they went to work and decided okay here's how we can make that happen so uh, at some point we did make a conscious decision to say hey you know what we are going to have this basically be able to interlock and connect into the rest of the sustainers yeah, it's and, an interesting blend between not compromising its necessary footprint yeah but still getting it into the sustainer exactly. format so and i think it, in my opinion we would have made the decision if we felt like it was going to compromise the functionality mm -hmm. to try to force it into this we would have went a different direction you know uh, just like with the Capex. The Capex doesn't fit in a sustainer, mm -hmm. obviously, um, because it's just too big and awkward. And so in that case, we said, hey, you know what? It can't be in a sustainer. It has to be its own thing. And so you always got to take those decisions as they come. Right. When we think about some of the design and, and the, the development of it, I noticed there's some pretty obvious things missing here from a table saw. Like, wh where's my trunnion? How do I adjust the height of the blade or the, the tilt? It, they're absent from this machine. What, yeah. What's going on here? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point, and uh, it's something that is obviously new for this type of saw. You don't see really any saws on the market that are having, uh, you know, motors that are controlling this up and down and the angle, um, unless you get to the big, of course, cabinet saws uh, that you would find. Yeah, I've in, seen in them a, big stationary, yeah, big stationary machines, top, you know, European-style saws. Right? And there's actually a couple of advantages here. Obviously, the biggest, most obvious advantage is that when you have these uh, stepper motor-controlled you know, angle adjustment, height adjustments, very, very precise. So we're talking 10th of a degree, which is mm. extremely precise. Um, and you can recalibrate it. So the precision was, a, I would say, the main driving force is we wanted that precision. But counter to what most people might think, these um, versus like a mechan purely mechanical trunnion, this takes up even less space too, yeah. right? So it really helped us achieve this compact footprint that we wanted. 
and not have these big bulky you know yeah, don't the worm gear, gear mechanisms yeah, yeah. and sure, uh, sure. and, and that, even the the durability wait. what we're told from the testing department is that these things are very well sealed very very robust very durable so under normal use there's there's no reason they shouldn't expect a long life and of course like all festival things they can always be serviced if needed um, but yeah it's a, it's a good point and it definitely adds to the cool factor i will say that and, and not so much on the height adjustment i think that's it's nice but it's maybe not a must have the angle adjustment though is really, really nice because if you need to back bevel something or you just have to go and take a little bit more off, you can just go click it, tenth of a degree, and, and get that perfect fit. And yeah, can those are trying to read the you know the old angle scales and is my cursor set are, right? Are you, there's two things, right? There. Are yeah. you looking at it correctly is one, yeah. and, and are, do you have good lighting? But then the second is all the mechanical systems that I've ever used at least, there's always a, a small amount a of slot small. before they yeah. catch. And so you're always kind of questioning, well, did I go, how far did I really well, go? I never wanted to trust those scales. I'd want yeah, to trust want to, where the blade is in real life. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a nice thing and it's one of those things that uh, what I found, at least in talking with some of our test users, once you use it, you're, it's hard to go the other direction, right? So every time we get something <laughs> you, in life, you that, go from this to <laughs> your old yeah, machine. Once you old. get something that's that's easy to use, it's hard to go back to let's mm -hmm. call it the old school method. Um, but yeah, great, great question. So, being that it's cordless, and we we, we talk about a little bit of precision and, and this portability factor, but runtime has to be practical for the job site, yeah, right? For sure. I don't want to have to carry a whole sustainer full of batteries to keep it going. What, what can we expect in terms of runtime and performance here? It's a, it's a good question. And these questions, of course, uh, we've had this discussion many times. They're always hard to answer because it's always like, well, what are you cutting? And how are you, how hard are you pushing the material? And there, so there's always a lot of questions. The one metric I can, I can share that I think is fairly consistent, uh, and everybody will have a reference for this, is if you are cutting, let's call it three quarter inch particle board, so something like melamine, um, you should be able to cut approximately 250 feet, lineal feet of three quarter material on a single charge, assuming you don't turn the machine off. So that's just leaving the machine running. Uh, we did that test a few times. Um, I think originally we even said it was 300 feet, but then we've kind of now said, no, we think it's more like 250 is a safe, is a safe assumption there. Uh, one, one learning I had, and again, this is almost counterintuitive until you think about it, is that when you turn the saw on and off repeatedly mm -hmm. in short bursts, it actually consumes more power because it's got to build, build that up. Yeah. It doesn't take much power to keep the saw running. So maybe just a tip for those of you that have the saw, if, you're, um, if you are going to be making several cuts, you might want to consider or try just leaving the saw running in between cuts, assuming it's not going to be like five minutes. If it's just yeah, going to yeah. be a few seconds, um, I would just leave the saw running. I wouldn't, wouldn't bother turning it off thinking you're actually prolonging battery life. You're, you're doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and maybe another just comment on the batteries, you know, right now we have the five amp hour batteries, but uh, people should keep an eye out. Uh, I think it's already been announced in Europe. You know, there will be bigger batteries coming, which will be compatible with this saw. So uh, when those do eventually get here, be a welcome, welcome addition for sure. And it'll definitely increase the runtime. We'll increase the runtime. Absolutely. Yep. Now, as far as the, the blade diameter, you mentioned earlier that it's the it's, uh, same as our TS-60, the new yes. TSV-60 um, for their main blade will, will run the same diameter, but most people, you know, portable table saws can be anywhere from seven and a quarter and 10 inch. Why did we land on this 168 millimeters and not a 10 inch machine? Yeah, well, that's a good question. There was, two, I think, two things to say here. One is uh, always keeping in mind we were shooting for portability and compactness, right? So we didn't want to have this monstrosity of a machine. Um, and of course, if you just look at this and imagine a 10 inch blade in here, well, now you've only got like a couple inches before and after the blade and you've got high issues. So this saw was going to get bigger to have a 10 inch blade. Um, and you know, if we would have said, look, what our customers have to do requires a 10 inch blade, then I think we would have made a saw with a 10 inch blade. But when we talk with customers and said, well, what do you really need to do? Let's say 95% of the time. And it was, I need to be able to cut two by material. Maybe I need to cut some LVL. Those are usually an inch and seven eighths or inch and three quarters. So you can, you can do that, no problem. Um, all your two by materials, of course, you can, you can cut on here, no problem. And then of course, all your sheet goods, three quarter, half inch material. So we kind of, we looked at it from that perspective and we looked at what are most of our customers doing 90, 95% of the time and can we accommodate that? Um, and the reality is, and many customers told us this, they have other options for cutting if I need to, for some reason, rip a four by four, mm -hmm. they have other methods to do that. A lot of them already have uh, what they would call a, a construction table saw. And so we, we were not trying to be everything to everyone and then be essentially not that great on all points. We were trying to really focus on 
where can we be the best and do a well, really, really good job. Well, going back to who we made it for exactly. and one of the, the applications, the, the, the depth of, or height in this case exactly. of cut is, is more than sufficient. And that's, you know, that goes back to what we talked about earlier in terms of runtime, but also power mm -hmm. and, and also portability. You know, as we grow to a bigger blade, all of those things are going to suffer. That blade's going to have to be thicker as well. And so uh, the noise is going to, like, literally everything else goes in a different direction if you go with a bigger blade. And so... Um, we happen to settle on this particular blade, which if you have a TS60 and you're a Festool Traxall user, that's also just a fantastic, uh, what would you call it, coincidence? Not really a coincidence because we <laughs> planned it that way, but right, right. it's nice that the blade on your Make Traxall is the same as the blade yeah. on this. And so if you do have a specialty blade, for example, for cutting solid surface or some other material mm. for your Traxall, and then all of a sudden you need to use this saw with that blade, you can just, just swap it, right it's no big deal. Keep going. Um, so it's just, you know, the fewer different types of blades mm -hmm. you got to stock, the better. So Chris, you're talking about blades being compatible between the TS-60, TSV-60, mm -hmm. and it's great to be able to swap them out, but what other benefits is there to be using a Festool table saw? Are there other system components that we can work with here or, or maybe amplify the usage of the tool? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, <laughs> I think it's obvious, but you can put a dust collector on the back, for example. So, you know, it does come with a dust bag, which we have back here. So it comes with a dust bag. Works reasonably well, much like with the KSC-60. Doesn't get everything, but, you know, if, if you don't need perfect dust extraction, but just want to capture some of it, works great. Um, probably my favorite thing to do with this saw, and it was one of the very first things I tried, and you got to love Festival Engineers for thinking through these little things, but this work surface on this cart is approximately 90 centimeters, 900 millimeters from the floor, which happens to be the same height that the MFT tables are, the Capex is, etc. And so one of my favorite things to do with this is if for some reason you do need uh, support to the left or additional support out here, mm -hmm. you could throw an MFT in either location and then have that in-feed, out-feed like, yeah, support. support. Table. So, um, yeah, let me just move this lid out of the way. So now the cart has its own It does. It has its here. own support back here, which I find to be really good for, for let's say, most things. Um, and it's great to have that outfeed support. But I'll give you an example. I was cutting some foam board over the summer, so just your standard pink foam styrofoam board. And a little big for this all, to be honest, um, a little cumbersome. But if you have an MFT out front and an MFT to the side, you can reasonably figure out how to it's maneuver It's all going to be that. on the same plane. It's all on the same plane. Uh, it works fine. And obviously, if you're cutting foam board, it's easy to cut. You know, you can cut it with a knife if you really want to. But uh, I think that was one of my things that I thought was really, really great about this saw in terms of system compatibility. It's really made to integrate with the rest of the components. It is. Yeah, it's made to integrate. Um, same thing here with the T-Trek slot. So if you do have the miter gauge installed on the sliding table, um, you can also use a clamp to clamp down to your uh, T-Trek slot there as well. Uh, clamp your material. Uh, am I missing? I, might, I feel like I'm missing something. So can you think of something else that I'm not mentioning? Well, I know the clamps, yeah, on the, on the miter slot. Um, oh gosh, there's probably more. <laughs> yeah, there probably is more. Um, and, and we kind of glossed over it, but this cart in and of itself, which of course it's was, a great work was designed for this particular saw. We knew we needed a cart to put it on. Uh, and, and maybe we can throw some B-roll up in the video to show the functionality mm -hmm. of the cart. But just in a nutshell, if I take the saw off, the cart surface itself becomes a little short work table, which sometimes it's nice to have a shorter work surface. Um, this back part here actually folds down, so it gives you a flat space here to work. And then what else is cool these legs, all four of these legs, quickly just pull the green latch here. They will fold in, and then you have two options. You can use it, if I stand this back up, you can use it as a hand truck, so it essentially works like a hand truck for transporting your tools. Uh, or you can actually put this table on the floor, and then you're maybe, I don't know, seven or eight inches off the floor, and you can work. So if you're doing flooring, that's really, I think, the best example of when would that be uh, helpful. So really just brilliant design. It's very simple, but also uh, very functional. Um, it does multiple things. I always love it when you can when something does multiple things and it does them all well. So. <laughs> well, it also brings you more efficiency on the job site. You don't have to take as many components. If you already have an MFT or even the STM over here um, as, a, as a, a place you're working, then to use it as an extension of this to support your material. It's well, and one thing best. else that's really nice is the way this saw has been designed and tested is it actually just sits on the table and there's some little engravings here that tell you where the feet go and so you can very easily 
pick this saw up and do what I just did, which is I moved it from the ripping configuration to now I am in the cross cutting configuration. So if I happen to be using the sliding table here, and let's say I have a piece of flooring that's four foot long, which is typical, um, now I have my outfeed support to the left of the blade, which is where I would want it, and I can do some cross cutting applications here. Uh, and just on that note, I'm sure it's been mentioned in other videos, but <laughs> this is always one thing that impresses me. We have approximately, what is it, 19 inches, maybe 18, 19 inches of crosscut capacity with this sliding table, which is just remarkable that that's, uh, you know, a lot of cabinet saws don't have that kind of mm -hmm. crosscut capacity, so. Yeah, that really multiplies the surface out here without having a bigger footprint. Correct, yeah. Yep. So, you know, in, in a pinch, you've also got an ad hoc, ad hoc what I would call miter saw, uh, and mm -hmm. so there are some situations where that would be very useful to people. So one thing that I think about is if you're cutting crown molding around the top of a cabinet, generally your pieces are short anyway, and you've got returns. And so with the ability to dial in this angle very precisely, you could actually cut this uh, flat, cut the crown flat, and it would work out pretty well. So you had the sliding table going, but to complete the full picture. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you just yeah, open unlock. this up. Yep. No, yeah. Yeah. What I was impressed with this miter gauge was the, the degree of swing. I mean, a lot of them will, will go, may go past 45 degrees, maybe up to 60, but this will go all the way up to, to 70 degrees, which yeah. is super impressive. And then the adjustable fence piece as well. And you know, that's something I didn't mention, but it's a great point. If you have a situation where, you know, even most miter saws, some go to 50 degrees each way, some, if you're lucky, like a Festool Capex or KSC 60 guy, I think goes to 60 degrees both mm -hmm. ways. Right, yeah. This goes even to 70. So if you have a, uh, a strange <laughs> really roof line or, or really you know, obtuse. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's, it's very, very capable in that regard. Mm -hmm. And then if we look at the setting it up for a, ripping if we can go back to the other orientation yep. so we have what already is here right in terms of the, the there's our rip fence but if you would go so, ahead and yeah, pop that table up. Pop that up yeah and so in the ripping configuration we've got approximately 11 inches uh, if you're really motivated you might be able to stretch it 11 and a quarter and still be clamped in there um, our thought process again going back to typical construction material sizes is we wanted to be able to deal with like a 2 by 12 in the event that you needed to. And you figure a 2 by 12 uh, nominal dimension is 11 and a quarter. Mm -hmm. And if you're ripping it, the assumption is you're, you're removing something. So if you've got 11 inches of roof capacity, it should get you by in most situations. Now, Chris, you, you've been speaking uh, imperial to me here, uh, <laughs> fractions and inches. Some of our customers also like to work in uh, the metric system. Yep. What can we do uh, to help them with that? You know, uh, why don't you pop the switch on over here? Oh, I just turned it off. Let's turn it back oh, on. Yeah, turn it back on. Thank you. Uh, so very, very simple. And if you want to go to metric, you're just going to hit your menu button twice. And you're going to go down here to units and switch it to metric. OK, perfect. So now your height will be in millimeters that you see here on the screen. As far as the scale, in North America, we are shipping it standard with the Imperial scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe I've been told by the service center they are going to stock the metric scales as a spare part. I don't know how much they are, um, but it looks like there's just a few simple screws. It might just be two, yeah, actually. I think it's a screw on either end. and then Screw on either end. It's yeah. two separate scales. Uh, so if you're somebody that uh, you know likes to work in metric, by all means, I think you should be able to order the scale as a spare part to swap it out. Mm -hmm. um, but aside from that, I think that would be really all you need to do to quote unquote convert it over. And of course this, you can switch back and forth. Yeah, if, you're, you know. if you're like me, I do all my, what I call uh, woodworking or cabinet projects in metric. And then if I'm doing anything construction, it's in Imperial. So, <laughs> so I think a lot, of, a lot Makes of people sense. are like that. You could even change your, your language in here. I've seen. You can you change your language. I haven't. German, German English, it. French. Yeah, I haven't Korean. looked at looked at all the languages, but there's a bunch. I know that. Yeah, there's language. So yeah, you've got, looks like German, French, Danish. I'm not even sure what that one is. I don't know that one either. Italian. Uh, Norsk. Nether Netherlands. Oh, yeah, so there's a bunch Polish. of languages. Yeah, so it's already in there. Even so the like technology aspect of this is super impressive. I know it's not the scope of this video, but we also have an online tool called the Work App. Yep. It's available on the uh, Google Play, uh, iOS 
uh, app stores, and uh, you can actually connect to the CSC with your phone and change presets. You can do uh, updates of the software, either to the batteries or, or the main unit itself. Uh, you can also track its uh, last known location. So a lot of cool features coming on the. Well, just uh, maybe I sorry to interrupt you, but yep. one thing on the work app which I think uh, everybody should have the work app and, and for one reason in particular, not only so you can do things with your machines, but uh, increasingly these more sophisticated machines, as this is a good example, but there's others out there, we are constantly working on the software. You know, So basically anything with a brushless motor in it has software attached to it. And as we figure out ways to make the saw more efficient or whatever machine it is more efficient, uh, uh, we get new batteries and it needs to interface and work properly. Not even necessarily that it won't work, but to work the best that it can with new batteries. Um, it's amazing like even our battery packs, they're on version, it's like 24 Depends on the pack, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's so the point, the point is if you yeah. get the work app, you should check, especially with some of these newer tools, and make sure you're keeping your software up to date. Not that the saw's not gonna work if you don't update it, but just that, like I said, we're, we're making improvements all the time. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanna take advantage of those improvements, you should update your software. Um, it's no different than your iPhone. I mean, I feel like I get an update every you know, month. <laughs> Ours won't be that often, I promise. <laughs> no. Um, so on the subject of technology, I have to ask for, for our, our customers and users, what about the SawStop technology? A lot of people know that our companies are affiliated, that yep. we're sister companies under the same umbrella. Why are we not using that AIM technology or anti-injury uh, and mitigation? Well, I'd say it's a very simple explanation, and there's, there's one real reason. There's also a second reason. Um, the real reason is, uh, for those of you that have been following along with the technology, the way the SawStop technology works is it's, um, it works, I always equate it to this, it works similar to a GFCI in your house, right? So what it's doing, it's monitoring the flow of current, and when it senses a interruption in that current, it triggers the braking mechanism. For that to work, you need a ground. Uh, with this being a cordless saw, this, this is, as far as I know, this is not quite possible, at least in the way that that is working. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say it, it couldn't ever be done, um, but I think as far as I'm aware, as of right now, there isn't a technological solution. Again, not to say it, we, somebody can't eventually figure it out. Maybe we'll figure it out, um, or maybe SawStop will figure it out, but I don't know that it, it actually exists yet. Uh, the secondary reason is also, if you go back to the beginning of this conversation, we really wanted it to be portable. And um, if you looked inside this machine, and maybe we can show some photos of it here in a little bit, um, there's not a lot of extra room. And if you ever look at how a saw stop mechanism works, you've got the big spring and mm -hmm. the aluminum block, cartridge. the cartridge. Yep. You need space for all of that. And so it goes back to, could we have done it? Uh, well, if we could have figured out, we could have made it corded, right, and just done that, one of those. Um, but again, saw stop already has a corded, precise job site table saw. Now it's bigger than this, um, but we didn't feel like that's what we were trying to accomplish. We were trying to accomplish precise and cordless um, and very, very portable. And so while we all would have loved for it to have that technology inside, it just was not an option for us at the time. Well, Chris, I think there's a ton of things we could talk yeah, about yeah. this machine. It it's is a good loaded. Machine. Yeah, it's a good um, machine. And I'm, I'm gonna enjoy talking about it for a very long time, but uh, yeah. let's, let's wrap it up for today and uh, we'll, we'll touch it again sometime in the future. So. All right, well, thanks, Rick, and I hope you guys, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, if you've got questions, throw them in the comments. We'll, we'll try to get to them the best that we can. And uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching.